Awesome, awesome. Church, we feel like we have been here for a long time, but guess what? We still have to study the Bible, chapter 2, and oh, I'm just so proud, you guys. This is what church is about. It, it's a process. It's committing. It's learning. It's growing, and I'm just so proud of all the students, you guys. You're investing in yourself, and as you invest in yourself, this is what the community needs. So thank you so much and congratulations. I'm so proud the parents should be so proud. A todos los papás deben estar super orgullosos de sus hijos. And I'm just so, so happy for that. And everybody received that little gift. So I want you guys to be able to open it, get your pencil and get your highlighter. And that might be uh, not too much for you. Like, oh, that's a cute pencil. That's a cute highlighter. But can I tell you that you only need a pencil and a highlighter? to be able to go into God's word. And as he speaks to you, to be able to highlight a specific word, as he speaks to you and instructs you to be able to get a pencil and start writing what he's telling you, there is power. God uses that pencil and the highlight to speak to you. So I really want you guys to take advantage today to be able to open your Ephesians chapter two, to be able to grab it and as we read and as we learn together, that we get to, that you guys get to use your pencil and your um, highlight. I think that that's all we need. Sometimes we like to decorate way too much God's presence. All you need is his word. All you need is his word. And if you have a pencil and a highlighter, let me tell you that God starts speaking. <laughs> and you start writing and it stays with you as you use all your senses. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, you're here. You have been here. And we just want to thank you. Thank you because your word is alive. Thank you because it's not about what we say, how we say it. It's just your word that transforms our hearts. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you speak to us, that you renew our mind this morning. That as we finish today's service, we all can live with a specific instruction for you, from you. We love you, God. We love you and thank you for allowing us to read. Thank you for allowing us to understand as we read a bunch of letters that become a word and then becomes a sentence. Thank you because that gift of understanding is what allows us, our earthly and our body and our mind to understand your beauty and your love. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. And as we today uh, study Ephesians 2, I, you know, as I was reading it myself, I was like, this is almost like a before and after. Literally, just God is putting, putting it all out there. And I know how many of you guys have seen those before and after pictures that are super funny. I have a few that I want to share with you guys. <laughs> and so this morning, I was having a conversation with my daughter. She was asking me, Mom, when was your first, when, when did you get your first cell phone again? And I'm like, 18. And she's like, were you able to take pictures with your cell phone? I'm like, no, I had a blue Nokia. Right now, if a, if a cell phone falls, obviously the screen gets shattered, but mine will break the floor <laughs> on how big it was. <laughs> so before, I don't know how many of you guys, I don't think anybody does this anymore. But we knew all the ingredients of shampoos and conditioners and soap because, yeah, before you used to read all the labels, and now what do you do? You're on your phone. Sometimes I have to tell my husband, do not take your phone inside of the bathroom. I need you in 15 minutes. <laughs> How many wives say amen? Or moms, if you see your son or daughter with their phone in the bathroom, take it out. Before, come on, this is hilarious. Before you used to use some type of big, chunky uh, cell phone case, and then obviously someone very smart just grabbed that little uh, rubber band, and, and this is how, you know, how you speak and how you go through life. But now we have those headphones that we can just run and work and do. I love that. But also we have makeup, before and after makeups. That is hilarious. And this is all for all my ladies. <laughs> with lashes and without lashes, right? And girls with mascara. <laughs> Be
before and after mascara. You guys, I have the craziest and funniest reaction from my son once. I not only not only I was without makeup, but also but I I had um you know like those acne treatments little things that you put like little dots and stuff. So I woke up the next day. I think I was getting a cold, so for sure I was like red, and then I had the acne treatment, and then I had no makeup. And Lu uh, Luca, he just looks at me, he's eight, and he's like, mom, are you okay? <laughs> and I'm like, eh. so I'm thinking, am I okay? I'm like, why? And he's like, you look sick. I was like, oh my gosh. So I'm sure I was that panda right there with the ma without the mascara. But anyways, let's go with the next one. And these are informa infor infomercials that I found from back the, in the days, you guys. Can you believe that these were the, this is the advertisement and people actually bought the product. Look at this, less wrinkles in, more, in only minutes. I mean, who, if you see this before and after, would believe it? Nobody, guys, because that cannot happen. Trust me, I've tried, I tried all the creams, and it doesn't happen. And look at this one. <laughs> Ten months after fixed teeth, and I can't read, and still smiling. The before and after. Look at this one, the before and after. Even her, with the, um, what is it, with the lip gloss, even her hair changed. And look at this one, you guys. The before and after, and they just turned the car around. I mean, this is what life is about. And today, we want to put a title to today's message as we study Ephesians 2 is the before and after picture. And we're going to go straight into Ephesians chapter 2 as Paul is writing. And he says, and you, he begins, it begins that, that, that way, like in a statement, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. Number three, we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out in the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under the wrath as the others were also. And I, I mean, it's crazy because it really pictures, it, it gives us a picture of our before and the after. This is the before of who we were. And it says that we were spiritually dead. Can we go into the next slide? So it really just paints the picture of before Christ and after Christ. I don't know how many of you guys have pictures that you can literally show and, and, and see for yourself your before and after with Christ. I have a friend that she keeps this picture and it's been for like 16 years, you guys. She keeps this picture in her fridge and every time I go to her house, I'm like, take it out. It's like a picture of her, you know, with like the little, little, little shirt and she's like dancing and you can just see it in her face clearly before Christ. And I'm like, well, why do you keep it? Every time I go, I'm like, take it out and she's like no I like to see it once because I love those apps and two <laughs> so you gotta be challenged you know I, I should do that <laughs> guys fuego latino I had apps I can assure you of that but she says so she says no I like it because of course the apps but also because it reminds me where God took me from I'm like wow that's nice and it's so crazy because a lot of us we can really even through pictures even through the way that we look and the way that we um, smiled and, and the people that we were with we can say the before and the after Christ can we go into the next one and there is two truths. One is how I think I am, and the, the other one is how I actually am. Because a lot of times we think, there is not before and after with me. I mean, I am who I am. I haven't changed a bit. But people can really notice. Can we go into the next slide? And this is something funny. But there is many times that we think we look one way, and then we end up looking another way. Can we take a look? And while they're looking for it, okay, so look at this. What I think I look like and what I actually look like. <laughs> and look at this one. This is so me, you guys. How you think you look with a face mask on versus what you actually look like. 
And that is me 150%. I, I'm like putting those masks on and I'm, I'm thinking I look like I'm in the spa and Alfredo's just like, oh, whoa, what happened to you? And, and, and in our life, like being very serious, in our life, we think <clears throat> that there is not a big difference. We think that getting to know Christ doesn't really change us to the core. And you really think that you look amazing. You really think that your life back then wasn't that crazy. But when we read Ephesians 2, when Paul, he draws the picture, or he shares the picture of the our before and after, we can go and really know that there is five things that he clearly says in those passages. Let's, let's go into the next one. And this is, I know this is not aesthetically pleasing. I know that all my designers are like, whoa, whoa, Steph, that, that was crazy. I actually told my husband, I'm going to make my own. Because this is how, this is my Bible right here. I just cross and put and write down and put a lot of, I love these. These are like my friends. So I really just wanted to show you guys a picture on when we start reading the Bible, how God starts speaking to us, how you can really just highlight it and with a pencil write down how God speaks to you. And we can see as we read Ephesians 2, 1, 2, 3, five main things. One, that we were spiritually dead. Two, that we are walking and we were walking in order before, walking according to the world. Number three, that we were under the control of the devil. Number four, indulging in the flesh. And number five, under God's wrath. This is a picture of our state. This is the reason why we need to be Jesus' hands and feet. Because this is how many people are today at the mall, how so many people are today eating lunch, how so many people today are living their lives. That's the reality. And that might be your reality today. It's our before Christ. And we're going to go one by one and kind of dig, dig in and see what it means. What does it mean to be spiritually dead? What does it mean to be walking according to the world under the control of the devil? So we're going to go one by one. And the first one is a spiritually dead. And, and when it comes to being spiritually dead... We're not just undereducated or just we need to do a little better. We're dead because of sin, and sin is deadly stuff. And we need to be able, I love how Paul puts it, because he says, you were spiritually dead. That's it. There is not just a little bit. There is not dot, dot, dot. It's through your imagination, and you think about it however you want to. No, it's clear. We were spiritually dead. And sin, like I said, is deadly stuff. It separates us. It alienates us from God who is the source of life. We didn't even know. We didn't even notice. But we were distracted by the loud noises of the world. And it's so crazy how we were so distracted that we didn't even see that we were walking dead. See what I did there? Never watched the show. But we were walking dead. <laughs> My husband says, yeah. Number two, walking according to the world. And Paul just keeps on digging in. One, you know, he goes into the soil and I feel like he just like takes out like these little treasures. Yeah, you were walking dead. And then the second one, he says, yeah, and you were walking according to the world. Paul goes on to talk about the way of life that sin produces. Sin is more than bad actions. It's corruption in our heart. And I love how it says it here that produces bad attitudes, wrong ways of thinking, and bad habits. So this is us. And apart from Jesus Christ, we walk captive to the ways of this world, the spirit of disobedience, and the cravings of our flesh. When we start seeing it that way, then we see that then our attitudes, even the way that we, our habits, even the way that we express ourselves sometimes, it's coming from sin. It's coming because we have been walking according to the world. And when it comes to the world, it's that media shows us how the world wants us to think. Media shows us and teaches us, it kind of aligns us into the way that we should be living. And a lot of us, we see nothing wrong with it. 
Of course, because we were walking dead and we were walking according to the world. And then Paul goes on and another one, he says, and you were under the control of the devil. It says the New Testament is pretty clear that there is a spiritual enemy that resists God's rule and will and who is out of like his, his life, like his whole purpose is just to keep us away from God. The devil is not God's equal and opposite. Instead, he was created good by God, but he rebelled and disobeyed. And now he seeks to lure the rest of the creation into disobedience. You might see it today and say, oh, Steph, under the control of the devil, that's a little too much. That's a little too religious. But that's the reality. If today you're walking in disobedience, if disobedience has been part of you, today you can see that it's not about a big spirit coming into you. It's not about the, the room getting dark. No. It's that being under the control of the devil, it's actually choosing to be disobedient and truly not even caring about it. I know it sounds hard, but I've been there. I was there. When my parents will ask me something, and I'll totally tell them the craziest lie ever, and I didn't feel bad about it. I was actually proud, like, acting skills. And it's so crazy, because today you read, you go into efficiency, and you're like, hold on. That means that the reality of my heart is that I was under the control of the devil. Now it makes sense. It allows you to see the state of your heart. And then we go into number four, which is indulging the flesh. It says it's not talking about just our physical bodies. It's talking about our flesh, like who we are, our deepest desires. It's usually to become people of goodness and love. But, but it's often sabotaged by the stronger surface level desires of our, flesh, of, of our flesh. And I love, it says that here we make our decisions and then our decisions make us. And a lot of times when we start evaluating our lives, we can look back and say, hold on, a lot of the decisions, a lot of where I am today and who I am with and the way that I'm feeling has to do and is connected to my decisions. You make those decisions and then those decisions make you. But a lot of the answers of the why, I don't know if you guys are seekers, but I am a big seeker. I always like to ask why. Also researcher, it comes to this. You keep on indulging, I keep on indulging in the flesh and desires what I want and I want it now. It turns out that sin makes people the same when we give into our flesh. We devolved to our remarkably unoriginal baseline desire. We use and repeat. We use and repeat. We messed up and then we do it again. We say sorry, we keep on doing it. And, and that's the life without Jesus. We just keep on messing up. I actually had a quote, but I had to take it out because he had an F-bomb and I was like, no, no, that's way too much, Steph, not here. But, but it's such a good poem. But it's an actual poem, by the way. And, and it says, the reason why we keep on messing up it's because we're not willing to be honest with ourselves. That we are just way too attached to our flesh. We are just blinded by it and we just follow our flesh. This Monday, on Monday, past Monday, I was talking to the CR um, group, the Celebrate Recovery, and we were talking about the power of walking in freedom. And one of the ways that we walk in freedom is that we take our body captive. And we were giving examples on how taking your body captive means that you're going to drink and you're about to get that sip of um, vodka and immediately you take, your soul takes captive your body. Your soul asks and feels, why am I doing this for? What am I trying to suppress? What am I trying to forget? But if you just leave it there, oh honey, you're in big trouble. Because then your spirit needs to keep your soul captive. Because your spirit tells you, good for thinking. Now you were able to notice, but let me lead you. And that's when the Holy Spirit takes captive of your spirit, your soul, and your body. Because the Holy Spirit starts leading you into the reason why, but also the exit. And that's when we understand what it means to be indulged in the flesh is that we just follow our desires. And then there is the next one, and it's God's wrath. And I know that it sounds super big <laughs> and super bad, but God's anger at sin and its destructiveness 
It's what means God's wrath. Sin is both a condition and a choice. We are responsible for walking in sins and, tris- and trespasses. When we choose to do that, we come under God's anger that's directed to sin, at sin. That's not necessarily saying that if you sin, God is going to kill you. It's saying that sin kills. It kills a relationship with God. It kills joy and peace in life. It kills the earth. It kills the relationships. That's what sin does. And it has consequences that spill out of, out of a society-wide level. And that's what I was saying that to all the girls students, that this is not just for you. This is for your community. Because the way that you're thinking, the way that your mind has been renewed, the knowledge and the personal decisions that you have made through this process, it's not only going to help you, it's going to impact your family and therefore your community the same way a sin does. Sin has the power to impact communities because one decision of someone that will hurt someone will impact a whole family and that family will be impacted and and they as they are impacted and hurt they're going to go into their jobs and they're going to go into places hurt and how many of you know that hurt people hurt people and we might ask ourselves well why god why is this world this way well when we read ephesians 2 the first four chapter of the first four verses It tells us that's the state of the world. The world is in God's wrath. The world is spiritually dead. The world is walking according to the world. It's under the control of the devil and it's indulging in the flesh. And I love as we keep on reading because we we feel the stock. Like when I read that, I was like, "Ah, okay, what's next? Because I know that that's my before. I know that that's where my, my, where my past goes. That's who I was. But what about now that I know you, Jesus? This section of Ephesians exposes our need. It exposes also God's gift. Because as we keep on reading on chapter 4, I love this. It says, but God. I love that. Because that's literally a point, a period that says, hold on. This is who you were. That's your past. But God, but God who is rich in mercy. I love this because of his great love that he has for us, made us alive with Christ. And even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. And then it says, he also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. But God... And I think that when we see relationships that are dying, when we see situations that are really hard, when we see that there is no changes, we can always remember what Ephesians 2, 4 says, but God. Maybe today you are at a situation in life where you feel like there is no moving forward. Oh, Steph, I love the before and after pictures, but in my life it has always been before, before, before. But can I tell you that Paul reminds us, and as we were learning last week from Pastor Alfredo, he reminded all the churches this is a special word, but God. Because when God speaks, when he says that he's going to do something, mountains will be moved. And But God. But God offers us a gift and God made us alive with Christ. It starts saying this, and I love, I love it. It says, by grace, you have been saved. We were objects of God's wrath, but God, but, God's, but God had mercy on us. We were dead, but God has made us alive with Christ. We were in bondage to evil powers, but God has seated us with Christ in the heavenly realms above all those powers. It changed our lives. Our whole destiny has been changed. The times where we feel like scared, we don't know what's going to happen, we don't know how 2023 will look like, this is our reality. This is our before and after picture because now by grace we have been saved because now God has given us mercy and his word says that his mercy is renewed every morning. Therefore, our perspective over life changes because even though that we're looking 
dead in front of us, our His mercy allows us to see a different way of life. The perspective changes, and when perspective changes, our whole mood and way of thinking changes. His mercy has that power because it reminds us again who we are. I remember when we were going out uh, with Alfredo, 2004. So I graduated from high school, and my parents gave me two gifts. One, a cell phone. Two, a car. Tell me how that is coming from zero to 100. <laughs> it's like here. So they, they gave me a, a cell phone. They gave me a car. Cell phone again, Nokia, blue one. Yeah. Panela, like literally like this rock. And then I had a car, but I didn't drive my car until 2004 because I was so scared. I didn't even have a cell phone, and now you want me to like drive a car? So I took classes. My dad gave me classes. He he was fed up, so he had to get um like a driver instructor to help me, and he almost gave up, but he he was getting paid, so <laughs> he had to he had to work with me. I was so nervous. I was so nervous, and just getting into I-75 or getting into the turnpike was like a nightmare. So. I started driving in 2004. I was actually, it was January. I got a job and it was in Miami Lakes. So that was all I knew. I mean, there, wasn't, there, there was no GPS, you guys. So my parents, my dad, he drew like, he, he, he drew, like the, the way to get into Miami Lakes on a paper and plastify it. Like it, it had a, like a plastic cover. So I just had it in my car, and every time on Mondays, I will go to Miami Lakes, I will take it out of the seat, because I didn't want people to see it, and I'll be like, okay, this is the way. So one, time, one day, on Wednesdays, I will go worship, like dance, at um, Alfredo's church, which was in Coral Springs. That's far, you guys. To me, that was like going to Orlando. I was like, I have to go to Coral Springs, and I have to get in the turnpike. I was so scared, and we, I would always go to a dancer that had a car. Specifically, I would put her on the, on the schedule. Like, okay, who dances on Wednesdays? The one that has a car so she can take me, because I wouldn't dare to drive all the way. But one day, one of the dancers couldn't go, and of course, I have to be responsible, and I have to show up. I was like, I gotta take the car. My dad says, fine, you're fine, let's go, do it. I go, you guys, I was like, oh. I get into the turnpike, and I'm so happy, I'm like, yes, this is the way, this is the way. When I get there, I do the whole thing, do the service, do the worship, and then I leave. I just left. I really thought that I was going the right way. And as I'm driving, like 25 minutes in, listening to Selena, I'm like, come on, flood, you know, and I'm like super happy just driving. I start seeing that I've been driving for 25 minutes and there is no Hollywood. There is no Pembroke Pines. There is no Miramar. There is nothing familiar. I'm just like reading and it says different things like Glades Road and, 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 and welcome to West Palm Beach. I got to West Palm Beach, you guys. So what it was supposed to take me 25 minutes back, like mom, no, it wasn't mom. It was like, mom, I'm gonna get there um, at 10. I got home like at 11.30 and I cried. I was so mad. Why? Because I thought I was going one way and I ended up going the other, but in his grace. When we look at our lives, Sometimes what we see, it's not enough, or we feel like it's not enough. It's like, God, you saved me. God, I said yes to you, but I'm not married yet. <laughs> God, I said yes to you, but where's the baby? God, I said yes to you, but where, 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 where's my citizenship? God, I'm with you, but why do I keep on feeling this way? But can I tell you that once you turn around, once you said yes to Jesus, things truly started changing. It might not be the way that you thought it was going to be, but God has been working in you and through you by his grace. In his grace, God gets us traveling the right road, going the right direction in grace. God restores us and begins to transform us. Jesus embodied God's grace, and he showed it to us, and he teaches us about it daily. And that's why we need his word daily. Because literally, this is like a GPS. This is like the GPS that my dad made me and put a plastic on. 
It reminds you the way to go. And so many times we get so frustrated because we're not seeing results. But we have to remember that by grace we were saved and that his mercy is renewed every morning in our lives. Tomorrow is a new opportunity. And as you look at the picture, the before and the after, remember about the panda eyes. Remember, before we were dead, there was no option. There was no purpose. There was no life. But by his grace, we are saved. When you start living that way, and when you start seeing life through that lens and perspective, your attitude changes. Because yes, God has done work in you. And I love how it says, but God. And then it says, for you, in uh, verse 8, you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, with God prepared ahead of time for us to do. We are God's workmanship. And as I was reading that, I went into the meaning of workmanship, and, and I, because that's not a word that I typically use. And. <laughs> And it was pictures of someone working on projects, of, of, of someone making and sculpting something. And, and I look back into the first time that I met Jesus. I know I'm not where my mind thinks I should be, but I can see the before and after. I don't have all the things that in my mind I think I should be having or that I should have or that I, w that I want in my, in my uh, nature, in my human nature. But I have everything that I need. And when you start seeing life that way, when you start noticing that we are saved through grace by faith, that He is working in us and that everything that happens to us, everything that we go through, even the mishaps of life, everything He's sculpting piece by piece because we are His greatest project. <laughs> we are His greatest creation. And I love that because first, Paul is so radical and so brutally honest which I like that's my language uh, love language just tell me the truth uh, but I love how Paul says it and then and then he reminds us even in the way that he writes <laughs> he, he starts changing the way that he writes and but God and his mercy and grace and then it says I, I, I just feel like this is the heart of the gospel I, I, I feel like if you have your bible this is something that you need to highlight and remind yourself daily. Because when we are in doubt, we need to remember that it's not what you do, it's who you are. That it's not about you boasting on, yes, I finished growing and I did the church thing and I served. None of that fulfills us as knowing deeply in our hearts that we are loved by Him that we are chosen by him that there is purpose in our lives god graced his grace saved us rescues us set us free forgives us transforms us and to finish paul being paul keeps on talking and he says so then so then so then remember that one time you were gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised which is done in the flesh by human hands 12 at that time you were without christ excluded from the citizenship citizenship of israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without god in the world we can go into the next one so then and I love the so then because then it's before, it's past, it's ayer, it's, it's not anymore, it's, 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 that's not you anymore, so then. And, and I love it because Paul is so smart, I'm telling you, and as I read Ephesians again, to me it's more of like, gosh, I like that way of thinking and I like that way of writing. Because then he says, can we go into the next slide, you guys? It says, but now. But now, now it means today, it means present, it means 
today as you are sitting here it says and i hope that you as we read this word by word it stays in your heart god is starts putting that truth into your heart and renewing your mind it says but now in christ jesus you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of christ 14 for he is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh he made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two resulting in peace 16 he did this so that he might reconcile both to god in one body through the hostility to death he came and proclaimed the good news of peace for you who were far away and peace to those who were near for though for through him we both have access in one spirit to the father 19 so then you are no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens with the saints and members of god's household Number 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. I think I told you guys last time that I was here that we were in remodeling season at my house. We have been living in that same house for seven years. But the day that we signed the, per the papers that we purchased the house, literally they told us something. Small, practical, welcome to your house. <laughs> and we were like, oh, we've been there for seven years, thanks. But as we stepped into the house, it felt ours. So now I was treating the refrigerator better. <laughs> <laughs> and I was making sure that the kitchen cabinets were well kept because it's my house. And I love how Paul puts it because it's now our kin it's the kingdom. It's ours. We are now with Christ he, Jesus himself as the cornerstone in, in the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together rose into a holy temple. It's ours. It's with him. Life has changed because he re he's rewriting our story. We're not longer foreigners and strangers. We are members of God's household. With Christ Jesus himself, he's the cornerstone, and we are being built together. So as I close today, I, I just want to tell you that the biggest gift that God has given us is his grace, that it's only received through faith. We are now saved. We are now growing in Christ. And that gives us the peace to be able to keep on walking. Can we go into the next slide? The next one. <laughs> he rewrites our destiny. The change comes when we receive God's gift of grace. And it continues as we walk in the new life God gives. We no longer walk in the ways of the world. Instead, we now walk in God's way. And this is the whole view of church. <laughs> this is what God says and what our church says. We walk God's way. And I want to leave you with this quote of this great book, one of my favorite authors of today. And, and he says, can we go back to it, please? To say yes to Jesus. And I hope you stay with this today. To say yes, yes to Jesus invitation is to say no to a thousand other things. As the monks used to say, every choice is a renunci renunciation. To say yes to Jesus is to say no to living by my own definition of good and evil. To spending my time and money however I want. To the hyper -individ individualism and hedonistic pursuit of our day. It's a thousand tiny deaths that all lead up to one massive life. It's not a futile grasping for control, but the freedom of yielding to love. It's saying to Jesus, whatever, whenever, whenever, wherever, I'm yours. It's true, it will cost us to follow Jesus, but it will cost us even more to not follow him. Let's stand up. There is a huge gift that we all carry. And it's the gift of Jesus, of knowing that by grace we are saved. And I want us as a church together to pray. And I want us together to be able to say thank you to Jesus. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for giving us a new life.
and thank you because we were walking one way and now we're walking another so god thank you so much thank you because paul wrote it perfectly it is your gift and it's through grace by faith and i thank you thank you for giving us a new life and thank you for giving us a new perspective it's tiny tiny changes tiny knows daily but we just want to focus in today lord and we want to be able to live one day at a time enjoying what it means to be free in you we thank you jesus and we thank you for our church thank you for this community that daily is pursuing to walk god's way i thank you lord in your name we pray amen and amen